All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Emma, one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library, and we're so thrilled to be hosting tonight's event with Ned. Uh, I want to start off first by listing the next two events that are going to be happening on Thursday nights at the library. Um, next week, uh, we'll be hosting a Halloween film screening of The Last Man on Earth, uh, starring Vincent Price, and that's October 27th at 6 o'clock p.m. And then the week after that, we're hosting our next Camden Conference community event with um, Maine State Economist Amanda Rector. And her talk will be Trends and Outlooks for Maine's Workforce and Economy. That's November 3rd at 6.30 p.m. Uh, and I'm happy to turn it right over to tonight's speaker. Ned Box's stories have been anthologized and featured in literary magazines. During his nearly four-decade career at Community College of Philadelphia, he won multiple teaching awards and has spoken at colleges, libraries, and bookstores about the art and science of teaching and learning. As a songwriter and member of Sacred Cowboys, he has recorded and performed widely. His songs have been performed and recorded by various artists in the U.S. and have been featured on radio programs, including A Prairie Home Companion. He is the author of a collection of short stories, City of Brotherly Love, and Open Admissions, What Teaching at Community College Taught Me About Learning which are both on that table over there, and he'll discuss that as well. And he is also a member of the Rockland Shakespeare Society, which is a beloved local group here at the library. Uh, and I'm going to turn it right over to Ned. Go right ahead. Right. Hey. <laughs> oh, thank you, Em. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, I am especially thrilled that the first uh, event that we have in Maine for, the, for this book is in a library, in uh, one of our favorite libraries here in Midcoast, Maine. So that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. The book launched two weeks ago uh, in Philadelphia, uh, where the book is set, and where it, I was working on writing it for many, 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 many years. Uh, but finished it here in Maine. And um, so we had the opening, the launch there, and that was a wonderful event. Happily drove back. To Maine, and uh, and this is the first event in in Maine. This Saturday, I'll be at uh, Sherman's in Portland. If you have any uh, neighbors or friends who happen to be down there and interested in something like that, so um, instead of talking about the book, I thought I would read a little bit to to start with. I have a passage from the first chapter, and I'll I'll read from there, and then uh, stop and talk. If you want to hear a little bit more from the book, I can, uh, I can read from a, another section, a much briefer section that, uh, that I can do a little bit later. And, we, and, if you, and I'd be happy to talk about anything about writing about the book and, and welcome all the folks coming in at all hours of the day and night. Uh, here. I love this room. I'm used to this room. This is the room where the Shakespeare, the Rockland, Shakespeare Society meets, used to meet, will meet again in the future. Um, but uh, so it's a room that I have great uh, affection for and great uh, happy history. So I'll read from the, this beginning part. The novel is about three different, very different characters. Um, and I won't say too much about that. You'll meet two of them in this particular chapter. This is the the first chapter, there is a prologue, and then, uh, which is really a flash forward, and then um, the first chapter. So I'm gonna pop through here and then we can, we can talk. And thank you for coming out. This is awesome that, that you're here. Mike Flanagan was pushing it, tires screeching as he cut corners on the river drive. Drive it like you stole it. One of Sarah's community college students had taught her the expression and she shared it with him over pizza from Golden Crust one night, but he wasn't about to say that or anything else. He hadn't been that late, but he swore he could hear a sizzle coming from the top of her head. And ten minutes of silence in the car was unlike Sarah. Maybe she'd had to deal with a horrible student today. By the time they were halfway to Center City, he'd acknowledged that after seeing her for nearly two years, it was right that he finally meet some of her work friends from the college. The apartment building was just off the art museum circle. He pulled his Reliant into a parking space in front of the high-rise building and turned off the engine. 
Sarah opened the glass door and strode into the vestibule. I won't embarrass you, Mike said, catching up at the elevator. She glowered at him, then poked the already lit button for the 14th floor. He immediately regretted his comment. Stupid. As much as he dreaded this encounter, the last thing she should think was that he wanted to derail this little coming out party. Riding the elevator, he watched her inspect the bouquet of flowers he was holding, then study the closed elevator doors. A cheerful array of colors for the winter, the florist had assured him. He watched Sarah take in every detail and could tell from her softened expression that she liked them. When they reached their floor, she glided onto the thickly carpeted hallway, the swish of her skirt and muted laughter from behind the door to his left, the only sounds. From an open door at the end of the corridor, a woman in jeans and a designer top appeared. She and Sarah hugged. Mike, I'm Sharon, the woman lilted. She pecked him on the cheek. While she took their coats and hung them in the wall closet, Mike eyed the ornate stenciling at the tops of the walls and the African mask across from them. Don't break anything, Flanagan. <laughs> Sarah apologized. Well, perhaps I'm skipping that part. The, the hallway walls were covered with original artwork that Mike was sure had to be Sharon's. You and I, she said to Mike in a confidential tone, are all that's keeping this from being a faculty convention. Oh, he said. We? I'm an attorney, she said, winking, and I've heard all the jokes. And they're all true, said a mustached man with gold wire room glasses who appeared at the entrance to the kitchen wearing a blue apron that had something in French written on it. After wiping his hand on the apron, he extended it to Mike. I'm Larry Goldman. A pleasure. Mike shook his hand. Larry and Sarah hugged. I teach with Sarah, Larry said. I am not an attorney. Mike wondered whatever happened to lawyers. Sarah, already decked out in an apron that advertised a cookbook from the New York Times, smiled at him. She was practicing what she preached, living in the moment. Across the kitchen island from another couple, she washed the bok choy while he sliced florets from broccoli stalks. More introductions. Leona Henderson Hennessy and Tom Hennessy. You're the Mike, Leona said, smiling. It was soon obvious that these people had all heard about him. The nice former student of Sarah's office partner, whom Sarah had finally worked up the nerve to ask out. Sarah loved to bring up the story. How did you grade us, Larry said. About the same as Ms. Devereaux graded me, he said. They all laughed. Very coy, Leona purred. I'm guessing that, you mean, that means you did pretty well in Florence's 101. Don't worry, he said, I'm not about to run any of you out of a job. They asked him more questions about his experience at the college and seemed genuinely interested. But when the conversation turned to cats, he felt his chest tightening. <laughs> Leona and Tom didn't have children. They had cats. Were all college professors cat people? He failed the cat test. He didn't hate cats, but they were so different from dogs. Wiss Cassett has some sort of flu, Leona said. The vet doesn't seem to know what to do. She shook her head. The poor guy knows what's in store for him when our car pulls up to the vet's office, Tom said. He just knows. I make Tom take him, Leona said. Looking up from the odd-looking mushrooms on her cutting board, she brushed the hair from her eyes. I'm not proud to admit that, but it's true. I don't particularly enjoy it, Tom said with a pained expression. He was going on about a trip to the vet, but he might have been talking about watching the nurses do heel sticks on his premature newborn in the NICU. What good would it do to tell this guy to get a grip? He was as likely to tell him about losing Laurie and little Michael. Mike took a pull on his beer. He might not need a passport to enter a center city high-rise apartment, but was there a guidebook? But now that the conversation had turned his thoughts to the two people he loved more than anything in the world, he wasn't sure he cared. Standing at the stove below two large woks hanging from an iron rack, Larry lined up bowls of chicken pieces, shrimp, and scallops next to him. Mike watched him place metal rings on the two front burners, set the two woks on them, then turn on the gas under each unit. Did those rings have a name? 
Do you buy them in Chinatown? He held his tongue. The worst moment in his English class had been when Miss Devereaux made him read aloud part of his essay. She'd wanted others to hear a good introduction. Now he took a deep breath and tried to focus on what people were saying, but instead he pictured himself rushing through the ER entrance in upstate New York, remembered knowing what the young doctor was about to tell him just from the look on his face. Seated for dinner beside Sarah and across from the hyphen Hennessy's, Mike sipped alternately from his glass of water and his beer, nursing both beverages. Knives and forks, Sarah asked. He glanced to see if she was looking at him. No doubt she was too polite for that. He picked up his chopsticks with one movement of his right hand and clapped them three times like a maestro tapping his baton. He recalled Friday night takeouts up in New Paltz when he thought he would never get the hang of chopsticks. Laurie laughing at his fumbling, little Michael in the high chair laughing because his parents were hysterical. <laughs> Lifting his glass, Tom offered a toast to the great people of China. After a round of self-congratulations, they quieted occasionally commenting on the quality of the shrimp or scallops. Halfway through his plate, he noticed that he was far ahead of the others. Check, clicking his chopsticks together, he looked at Sarah. Great, he said to her. Isn't it, she said. He breathed out slowly. Do I do everything at a different pace than the rest of them? Fast or slow, he was out of step, on his way to failing another test. His plate would be empty in a few more bites. He put down his sticks and sipped again from his water. Sarah had never set out to test him, but his scarfing marked him as an outsider, as sure as his ponderous knife work had done in the kitchen. So Tom, Sharon said, what's it like running this division-wide committee for the vice president? Mike heard Tom's words, understood what he was talking about, if not the exact points he was trying to make. But after five minutes, he let the thread slip the way he imagined he would tune out someone speaking a foreign language he'd studied but not mastered. When the others finished eating, Leona asked Sarah about her background in linguistics. Yes, she told Leona. She did work for Billabo when she was in graduate school. She explained that she had done all sorts of gopher work for him while she was a grad student. Mike couldn't see Sarah being anybody's gopher. Strange bird, wasn't he, Leona asked. Sarah rolled her eyes. A man at the end of a very different era. He had this system for teaching and he expected absolutely everyone to follow it. They were all glued to her, sort of smiling the way a comedian's audience looked when they were anticipating the next punchline. Mike grasped that somebody named Richards, whom they'd all heard about before, was this guy's rival and that Sarah was caught in the middle of this college professor spat. She rolled through the story like it was a performance she'd rehearsed and waited all her life to do. He imagined this was the way she acted at work. Billabo decided that I should be the one to observe all the faculty and report back to him, Sarah said. Me, fresh out of graduate school, checking on people who had been grading me the year before. Of course I protested. Ms. Goines, he said to me, you are low man on the totem pole. Mike laughed with the others, though it hardly seemed humorous. <laughs> Richard suggested lunch at the faculty club, Sarah said. We had drinks, then ordered more drinks. Finally, I screwed up my courage. Dr. Bilibo is a good friend of yours, I said, but he's a little upset that you're not teaching the method. I swallowed. But I know that you can, he, I said. Because any idiot can, he cut in. Everyone laughed. Sarah glowed. She almost looked like another person. I looked him straight in the eye. Tell me a time, Dr. Richards, when you will teach the method, I said, and I will take copious notes. Otherwise, the consequences to both of us will be a little dire. She paused for effect. Have another drink, Ms. Goines. Oh, God, Sharon howled. They were convulsed in laughter. Seeing Sarah so triumphant made Mike smile. Larry Hiccup, spritzing wine out of his mouth. Mike had known room-rocking laughter with Laurie and their Michael, and before that with work pals. It was what you did on a Friday night, cut loose with your own people. Right about now, the roofers and plumbers down at Gilhooley's were hooting it up. 
He pictured his brother, Brendan, pulling another six pack out of the refrigerator. Dolores taking the kids to D'Alessandro's for cheesesteaks. These people were just blowing off steam their own way. When the deed was done, Sarah said, I told Bilibo, you wouldn't believe the transformation in Dr. Richards. Laughter filled the room again. Sarah's eyes sparkled. Her beaming face flushed like a kid who'd been out sledding all afternoon. Mike wondered how many other stories like that she had in her. He had seen her glowing before, full of herself, happy, but he'd never seen her like this. He wished she could taste that more often. For Lori, that natural joy was an almost daily experience, and he and little Michael always seemed to be involved. No more. The field attracts very strange types, Sarah said. She put her hand on Mike's, smiled at him, then looked across the table. Poor Mike, she said, shaking her head. We've convinced him that professors are a bunch of loonies. Nothing he's heard tonight, Larry said, would make him think otherwise. They laughed. Mike smiled again, picked up his napkin, and wiped his mouth. You've all seen those special train displays around the holidays, Sarah said, catching her breath, right? She was looking at him, at him a wry smile on her face. Train clubs, Tom said, enormous displays. That's Mike's basement, Sarah said. Mike reddened. Kind-hearted Sarah would not let him feel left out. He wished he could think of a way to make her stop. Just a hobby, Mike stammered. Nonsense, Sharon said. The wiring alone, Sarah said. Houses, roads, sheets of plywood for the platform base with a layer of foam board neatly screwed in on top. He's painted the walls around the layout to blend in. It's an inviting little world. There are books, Mike cut in, and you just make your mistakes. It was sweet of her to do this, but enough was enough. I had American flyers when I was a kid, Larry mused. Pity, Tom chirped. Lionel's were the real deal. The three rails make them look like toys. Toys! Children, Leona barked. They all laughed. It's not just a Christmas thing for him, Sarah said. He works on it all year round. Is no one else pained by her campaign to make something of me to these people? Such a move was not in Lori's repertoire. Never would have been. Stop it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So th those are two of the main characters. They're, each of the three characters has a, a complete story arc in the novel. So you, and there's, their lives become increasingly connected and complicated because of the connections. And uh, it's, I didn't mention before, the book is set in uh, 1989 which, as you may recall, was a year of uh, pretty significant change uh, globally. Lots going on, Tiananmen Square, the Berlin Wall coming down, just a lot of major changes in the world. And uh, the setting, that, that time of change uh, appealed to me uh, and as being a, a good time to look at people and what anchors them and what, what can happen to those anchors under stress. And also a look at the families that we're given and the families that we choose. So it's a book very much about those kinds of families too. And um, it's a story that I began writing when I was in my MFA program. This is going back uh, 1986. That fall, I started working on a short story that actually was very much the, um, the basis for this, this, this chapter that I read from. And, um, and I, you know, I thought it was a short story, but my, uh, my teachers told me, uh, I think this, you might have a, a novella here. So I, kept working on that, and uh, subsequently another professor said, Ned, I, I think you, you really, you've got a novel here. I said, no, I was really looking for a story. He said, yeah, but I think you got a novel. <laughs> so, uh, and that was back in the 80s and into the 90s, and I would keep working on these during the summers. I was teaching 
at uh, the community college in Philadelphia. And uh, at a certain point, I had summers available for writing, and that's what I did. But I didn't work on this every summer. Uh, I worked on a cycle of stories that subsequently became the uh, book of stories over there, City of Brotherly Love, which is obviously also uh, set in, in the city. And, uh, and then, of course, the, the memoir about teaching and learning. And another novel manuscript that's still in the works. So I would, depending on, you know, once the summer came, I could finally look at writing again. Because I could never do that during the academic year. I just was too consumed with uh, the teaching work. I, I couldn't keep up with both. And I was happy to concentrate on teaching. But when, when the summer came, I, the first thing I did was sort out my plans for the fall. So I would revise my courses, work on new courses if I needed to, and do that for about a month. And then I could concentrate when I wasn't painting a room in the house or you know, doing something like that, I could concentrate on writing. And, and that's what I would do. So, um, so it's, it's 36 years in the making, but it's not like there was continuous effort all that time. That would have been a little crazy. So, uh, so it's a long journey, but, uh, but I'm glad I've gotten to the point where it's finally found print, and uh, I'm very excited that it's, that it's out. So um, I can read another little section if you, if you like. I'd also be happy to take any questions you have. What would, what would your pleasure be? I really appreciate you coming out tonight. Uh, it's great to see familiar faces and some faces of folks I don't know. So thank you. Yes? Um, would you call, with all the time involved in writing that, would you be more of a plotter or a panther? See what the panther says. More of a what? A plotter. Plotter or? or I said a, a panther, a seat of the panther. A seat of the panther. Oh. You've heard that term, right? Uh, yeah. Sort of, yeah. 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 Um, well, the great thing about writing is erasers. <laughs> I mean, that's the best, that's my best advice to, to other writers is keep an eraser close. Or, you know, hit that delete button if you need to, but, you know, the eraser is good. And then save is good because you can keep those mistakes and look back at them and remember. But um, so I think I, th this is a roundabout way of responding to your question. Um, one of the things I did that inadvertent, unintentionally, I think, really was extremely helpful to me when it comes to writing was to take uh, an acting class, an improvisational acting class in New York. I did this uh, at a difficult time in life. My mother had just died, and I uh, was also sort of looking at my career direction. Just wasn't sure what I should be doing. I was working as a counselor at the time at the college and subsequently got an MFA and transferred into the English department where I stayed for hundreds of years. <laughs> um, but I took an improv class at the new school in New York. So once a week, I would take the train from Philadelphia. And I'd never done anything like that. But I had been doing music and comedy before in Philadelphia and enjoying that. But wondering, you know, this might be a good thing to do. You know, maybe I'll do stand-up or maybe I'll be more of a serious actor. And I did a little of those things and enjoyed it. But what I learned was I could actually survive in improv, that I had some talent and got some enjoyment from it. Also learned that I was nowhere near good enough to be a professional, but that was good too. That was, that was fine. But I really believe that the experience of doing improvisation was helpful because when I sit at the computer and work, it's improv. So it is seat of the pants in a way. It's improvisational work. 
your, your characters are doing improv. And that I found that to be incredibly valuable. So I let them go yeah, yeah. and just tried to keep track of them. And it was a rough ride for decades to, to keep on top of that. But that was an incredibly beneficial experience. I, I really appreciate it. And subsequently, I took another class in New York uh, with uh, a, a young, oh, she was then a young woman, uh, who was also just really good um, and, uh, and loved it. And it was helpful in so many ways. I think it was helpful in terms of classroom teaching. I think it was helpful in terms of performing. I, I, I played with the same rock and roll band for 40 years, and I still enjoy being in front of the crowd. Um, and, and I, but surprisingly, I think it really benefited my fiction writing. It just, I just let the characters be improv actors. But thank you for that question. Yeah, sure. No, that's a good answer. Yes. Joseph. So you started writing uh, the short story in 1986, you said. Uh, you set the book eventually in 1989. Right. Was there, was there a year in mind when you started writing it? And secondly, was there an episode in your life that even launched the short story? No, no, no. no it just, not at all, no. Um, not really. It's... The characters just sort of showed up on the computer screen, and I was looking desperately looking for characters. And I had in mind that my fictional territory logically seemed to be the world in which I had grown up and lived as an adult. I was in basically the same neighborhood where I, I spent from age about age eight until ten years ago in the same Philadelphia neighborhood. And, uh, yeah, we lived, like, I don't know, 10 blocks away from apartments and row houses that I lived in with my mother. Um, and um, what was the rest of your, your question? It was just between eight, uh, 1986 and 1989. I wondered when you made that switch oh. to select 1989 well, particularly. It, really, it wasn't, at the time, it wasn't a, I got to plant this in this era or whatever. It was... Was, I'm writing contemporary fiction. This is what's going on. So there yeah, it is. Right, sure. Little did I know that it would eventually become uh, a costume drama, period piece. <laughs> you know, it's 19, oh. 1989. Um, so that was uh, that was kind of a surprise. But that was just a function of the fact that years rolled by. But I I never considered changing the time. I liked the time because these characters are very much formed by that world in which they grew up. Uh, and part of it, it's cultural, part of it's religion, it's certainly social class. You can see the conflict of social class that Mike experiences in that painful uh, dinner party scene with his betters. Um, and, um, and then Dominic shows up. And uh, he's a 75-ish semi-retired barber who also has his share of tremendous losses in life, just like Sarah and Mike do. And, um, and they surprisingly find themselves connected, um, almost never at the same time, the three of them, but the, Mike and Sarah, Mike and Dominic. Sarah and Dominic, there are lots of scenes with them getting to know each other. And of course, in scenes like that, the reader knows more than the characters do because the reader is privy to what's been going on in the previous scenes with whoever's not the point of view character in that chapter. So um, certain things that are said or are not said uh, are gonna make, are gonna have impact on the reader hopefully, um, because the characters don't know as much as the reader does. Yes? What makes it a Philadelphia story? Because you, it took you about three seconds, you immediately started talking about neighborhoods, and Philadelphia's neighborhoods, the streets, we just met, we were both in Philadelphia. 
and I and I'm, I'm here on serendipity because this room, Mary French is wrong. What makes it a Philadelphia story? I mean, that I can hear it in, your, in the way you tell the story. But because that I, that's really that became my fictional territory. When I sit down to try to write a story, that's what comes to me. Um, that's what feels so there. I don't have to work to get that. I've got it. I know those people. And I grew up, I, my childhood was, um, was rich in the sense of exposure to many different kinds of people. I was raised by my single mother, and she was a, a waitress in a coffee shop and had English was her second language, had come to the United States, uh, learned English. My father was an American in the American military. They were divorced before I, you know, when I was very, very small, when I was like a baby. And so I, so she, her story really um, is my defining story. And her story became a Philadelphia story because after spending time in Quebec, where she was from, where I was born, and then Oklahoma, where my father was from, and then after the divorce, she took off trying to find jobs where she could take care of another child and take care of me. Um, Arizona, Los Angeles, uh, Gary, Indiana, New, New City, New York. And finally, her friend, um, whose husband had also been in the Air Force and knew my father, um, was going to be stationed in Iceland for a year, and she was going to be alone. He was from Philadelphia, from North Philadelphia. And, uh, and would she like to be with, be around her? And she did, and the next thing we knew, it was time for me to go to school, and that started that process. But through my education, in my 12 years of, high, of grade school and high school, I think we had nine, ten addresses. I mean, because of the vicissitudes of life for a single mother, uh, my father never paid a cent of alimony to her, so she did the entire thing on her own. So, uh, so I, was, I was blessed to live in all sorts of places. Um, when I go back to Philadelphia, I go visit these streets where I remember we lived in the second floor in that place. And, um, and even though we, we really had very little money, I, I never felt in any way poor because I, she made sure that that didn't happen. I didn't feel it. I was protected. I was cared for. And I had the advantage of being around so many different kinds of people in this big city, this diverse, interesting city. And, and it's still like that. So Philadelphia, it would be, it's hard for me to think of writing something. The other novel I have is, starts out in Philadelphia, but then the characters go on a road trip. So that's a little different. And I've thought of possible fictional situations in Maine or elsewhere, haven't finished those things. But Philadelphia is always going to have that anchor for me in terms of being able to write about it. And um, it's still very much alive there in my, in my head. And I'm sure it is for you. You lived in Chestnut Hill. Yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up there. I, I mean, my parents moved out when I was 18. Then I was back in town. And it was different, as you said, you had one way of Philadelphia and I had another. It's a different time. We could have been on the same 23 trolley. <laughs> Any number of times going up German Tenet. Any times. That could have happened. Absolutely. Um, you look for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
Yes, Joseph. Sorry to be so full of questions, no, but no. Uh, 1989, I don't remember. So help me <laughs> out here. <laughs> uh, Tia, you mentioned Tiananmen Square, and you, uh, you mentioned one other, but I missed it. Do the events of the world that happened in 1989 no. come into play in no, the book they, at they all? No, they really don't. It's, to me, it's just sort of underneath it all. Was there something in America in 1989 that uh, fits into why no, you picked 1989? No, not specifically, but it all, it felt like, oh, I'm glad it's set then. It, it wasn't like it needs to be set then. It just was. You like the fashions of 89. <laughs> <Is that it? laughs> yeah. it was, okay, uh, I just wondered if I the knew, world impacted the story in any I way. I knew what stores existed when and where, you know, in that era. Although I've made some, a couple conscious changes with, uh, with that. Otherwise, it's pretty much rendered accurately as far as uh, places that are named. And much of the story takes place, most of it, takes place in Roxborough, Chestnut Hill, Germantown, Mount Air. Mostly in Mount Air. It's very much about that. Uh, which is a unique situation, a unique neighborhood continues to be, uh, and was so uh, even when I was growing up. It was a neighborhood that uh, did not uh, experience white flight the same way most other neighborhoods did. There was a concerted effort for um, people to resist that, and, um, and consequently, its evolution is much more inclusive and uh, accepting. Yes. Um, so you talked about chosen and given families. Are there any uh, distinctive characteristics that your characters have that draw them to choose one or the other, or is it just kind of a natural progression? To choose one or one or another. Yeah. One. Is there like some reason why you, the characters are like, oh, I can't tolerate my given family, and I'm seeking out therefore a chosen no, family, no, it's, or it's, is it just a natural? It's family? not really that kind of desperation, it's more a consequence of what's in them and what's missing, what's lost. They've all had profound loss. And, uh, <clears throat> and you learn Can you that. Can you give an example Oops. of the profound loss? Well, the one is alluded to in the passage I read from. Mike, who's 30-ish, uh, was married very much loved his wife and baby, and they're killed. I won't go any more into that, but they, they die. And that's the defining experience of his life to date. So it's not so easy for him to have this relationship. And Sarah has her own issues, which gradually become apparent, and likewise, Dominic, I th we would would it be all right if I read that little passage featuring um, a couple of, a couple other characters? This is what you need to know. This is from much farther in the book, but um, it's um, Sarah has gotten involved in breaking up a brawl, and as a result of that, she is fearful that. The perpetrator may be trying to harm her. So she's worried about this. She's also heard from Mike about this guy that he's met, this old guy that he's met. He patched up when uh, he was he found him late at night, having been mugged after coming home from playing bingo. And he keeps talking about this guy. And clearly, Sarah, who's really desperate to make this relationship work, loves the guy, uh, is very curious about this. So when she finds out, she calls up the barber shop, she finds out he's a barber, and um, talks, doesn't even know what she's going to say, kind of an improv moment, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> gets nowhere. And he's awkward, she's awkward, it doesn't work. So she hangs up. Um, and this guy that she's afraid of is uh, wears a, is here in a pompadour. It's kind of a 
a, a distinctive and odd bird. Um, so I think that's enough for you to, to know that. Let me see if I can find this. Here we go. So she's in her office at the college. She'd spread out the Inquirer food section on her desk and held a pretzel in one hand and a spoonful of yogurt in the other when she heard feet shuffling at her doorway. She twisted around and saw an old man peeking at her around the corner. Ms. Goins, the man, stepped into the open hall doorway, an overcoat slung over one arm. I'm looking for Sarah Goins, the teacher, he said. His accent, Italian, South Philly. His craggy face bore some resemblance to the guy with the pompadour, but she couldn't be sure. And if I am, she said, her pepper spray sat inside a pocket of her coat, which hung on the back of the office door. I'm not trying to be funny, he said. I don't think you're funny at all. She slid the drawer open and put her hand on the scissors. Somehow, he said, I think you are. What's it to you? What's it to you, he said. You called me. You're the barber, she gasped. She closed the drawer. He looked at her as if she were foaming at the mouth and she felt her face turning crimson. Dominic? He shook his head. I don't know what I'm doing here. She took a deep breath. No, please, sit down. Warily, he took the chair closer to the door and laid his coat across his lap. Sarah realized she was shaking. Your voice sounded different, she said. I'm sorry. He looked much older than her parents, but she couldn't tell by how much. His hair was mostly gray, cut short, but not quite military short. He wore a baggy pair of gray slacks and a white button-up shirt that needed ironing. Never talk to a college professor, he said, drumming his fingers on his overcoat. You're a friend of Mike, she said. He's my go-to guy whenever I get mugged, he said. Nah, he helped me out one night, that's all. You probably know him a lot better than me. Sarah blushed again. I don't know, maybe I know him too well. The old man seemed to consider that for a moment. Who is it exactly you're worried about? Whoa, she said, bristling. She breathed out slowly. All right, it hasn't gone as well for him and me as I wanted it to, and I didn't exactly help him when he probably needed it. She told him about her classroom brawl and the consequences. He listened to her story the way she'd hoped the dean would and the way she'd expected Leona would. Mike knows about this, he said when she finished. She nodded. There was a definite edge to this old man, but she no longer feared he might say or do something dangerous. I knew something was wrong, but he wouldn't go into it. He, he tried to listen like you. Doesn't sound like such a bad guy. Things have gone badly in his life. I do worry about him. Is anything going well for him? She shrugged. I guess I'm not the one to ask. Probably that dog of his gets the inside story, Dominic said. Tell you the truth, I think I was a little jealous of you, Sarah admitted. There's a list of things he won't go into with me. We talked about sports and indoor lighting, Dominic said. He looked away from her, scanning the walls. I don't know that we should be talking like this. He shook his head again. And I'm afraid I can't be much assistance to either you or him. The old man rose to his feet. Thanks for coming, Dominic, she said. Thanks for not stabbing me, he said, glancing at the drawer. <laughs> Sarah's face reddened again, three times in one conversation. Nobody had ever done that to her before. The old man turned and was out the doorway. So that's, that's our Dominic who enters the scene later on. And things really start to get much more complicated when, uh, when Dominic enters. And his cronies at the, the local barber shop uh, also become kind of a Greek chorus in the, in the book. So. Uh, there you are. So, uh, other questions? Yeah. Who do you like to read? <clears throat> what uh, writers do you like? Oh, geez. I, I like to read a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm not as up on contemporary things as I'd like to be, as I should be, but uh, I do like some of the people out there. I was really blessed that uh, Susan uh, Conley, who's a main novelist, really good. Uh, was generous enough to, I don't know her from Adam, and 
she agreed to write a blurb for the for the, the cover, and uh, and it's wonderful. Uh, and her most recent book, which just came out in paperback, uh, called Landslide, is really good, really good about a lobsterman, and really more about the lobsterman's wife. Uh, really powerful, well written book. I'll have to look for it. Thank you. Yeah, she's she's really good. Uh, some of my favorite writers, one of my favorite writers of fiction uh, for, for a long time was a man named Howard Frank Mosher, who wrote about northern Vermont, completely different from Mount Airy in Philadelphia, but incredibly insightful. And I'm convinced that when, when an author does a deep dive into any particular culture, that, it, that they re if they really do a deep dive into it, there, there's a chance that they're gonna tap into the universal. And of course, that's what happens with somebody like Howard Frank Mosher, uh, James Joyce's Dubliners, uh, just so many different writers who've picked, you know, wh whatever it is, uh, uh, August Wilson's plays about black America. Um, you read about that particular cultural niche, but you're really getting into what's universal in the human experience. So, but th thank you for the question. Um, other questions or comments or anything? Well, I'm, I'm just thrilled to, to see you all here. It's, it's awesome to, uh, to get to spend some time like this with people who uh, who read who like stories. Joseph, you're in good company, you know. John Irving's new book just came out on Tuesday, so oh. you published it just the right time. So somehow you've got to get the connection there. I think he's from Philadelphia, actually. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes. Oh, you mentioned a racer. Did you start writing on paper? Like uh, yeah. When I started, I didn't even own a computer. And um, one of my fellow students said, you need, you need to be able to revise extensively. So you want to get a computer so you can get files. So I, I did that. And within like a week, I had a hard time doing any writing away from the computer. But then when I print it up, what I like to do is print up a chapter or a scene and then to start writing on it. And that's where the eraser comes in. Pencil and eraser. Uh, and you know, drawing, scratching this up, moving this or that. And then I take the mangled, you know, paper and get back to the computer and work on it that way. But yeah, I do love the, the eraser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it difficult to transition from short story to a longer novel format? Um, some people think short stories are harder to write than novels. Some people what? They think short stories oh, are harder to oh, write yeah. than novels. Well, a sh writing a short story is, in a way, more like writing a poem. Because it's so limited by, by the, the, the size and form. Um, and I, I liked it. And I've written songs, so I'm used to that little bit of poetry, mostly songs, which obviously very specific demands for fitting. Um, but um, a novel is novel requires architecture. That's the, the big challenge there. So that requires a level of organization that's different than in a short story. It just pacing falls. and yeah. Right. Well not, not even I'm not thinking so much about pacing, I'm thinking more in terms of like just having the whole story or each character's story in your head or on, in my case, on charts and you know, all sorts of things. It's, it looks like one, you know, those uh, British detective stories where they, they have the board and the picture of the, the suspect here and the victim there and that's kind of like what the room looks like after a while. So, uh, are there any, anybody right in here? Anybody? enjoy or think about writing? Just getting into it. As an adult ed class, uh, 
fiction every week. We get a prompt from the teacher, and oh. there's ten of us in the class, and we write a forty-five minutes to write a short story based on the prompt. Mm. We read it in class, so a lot of us, me included, it's the first time we get any direct feedback. So it's been it's been great. I'm enjoying it. Short story. Uh, there's so many great short story writers. Andre Debuse, the father, his son, same name. It, it, lives in Massachusetts, continues to write bigger works. He writes novels, uh, and he wrote a great memoir. Um, he's wonderful, but I grew up really venerating the work of his father. He was just a, an incredible writer of short stories. And Raymond Carver, another great one, Alice Monroe, there's so many <coughs> really fine short story writers. Sean O'Hara. Old, old school, old school. I think, of, yeah, I think him. I think of novels. I, uh, he was from Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Oh, was he? Oh. Saki. What's that? Saki. S Saki. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. I thought you meant Saki, Pennsylvania. <laughs> there could be a Saki, Pennsylvania. There's a, there's a Jersey Shore, Pennsylvania. <laughs> of course, Maine has more than its allotment of bizarre, inappropriate place names. China. China, north this, south this, it you know, fill in the country, crazy. And then, of course, people pronounce them very differently. It took a while to get used to Bremen instead of Bremen, Cal Calais instead of Calais, mm -hmm. but welcome to Maine. <laughs> How about Dara Mascata. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was an Italian town. Yeah. Where are you from? Dara Mascata. <laughs> and just seen like that. How about that? How do you come up with a name like that? Um, anyway. Um, any other questions? I, I, I do have some copies for sale. Um, if anybody wants to order a copy, I have information about how to order how to order. But if you if you if you buy it tonight, I will uh, be happy to inscribe it and sign it for you. And, um, and that's that. Thank you so much for coming. This has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to Anna and the mighty Rockland